In the first part of this video, we followed the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment crossing the North-South Railroad by using an underpass. They didn't get much further on the 18th. The other regiments and armour divisions were following. So the next objective was Bra, which is over there, part of the IF now. And then Hubert Folly. Three RTR were followed by the second, five and four far yeomanry. Now squadrons A and B passed by Kanye, which is just over there, with no problem. But squadron C was some way behind and the Germans were starting to recover and only four tanks of the squadron C survived. Jack Thorpe's tank reversed right back to the first railway line that they crossed, which is the other side of the motorway, we can see over there. And he joined up with the Hussars who were just arriving, the 3rd Regiment of the 11th Armoured Division. Another survivor was the Firefly of Trooper John Brown. They passed the carnage, they were advancing with their gun firing backwards. And then they realised it was on fire. So John Brown tried to get out, but found that his hatch was jammed by the gun. So he managed to squeeze through and get out the co-driver's hatch, because there wasn't a co-driver in the Firefly, and all the crew got out. Then they realised it was only the tack on the hull of the tank that was burning. So Trooper Brown got back in the tank, he just started it up, and an armour-piercing shell went right through it. This time he got out a lot quicker, so they made their way back to the railway line. B Squadron now came under fire from Four, which is there, spelled F-O-U-R. Steel Brownlee saw a panther going into the hamlet of Le Poirier and stuck its nose through a hedge. One of the crew was putting camouflage on it, and his firefly knocked it out. In Sergeant Hurd's tank, they saw Captain Miller's tank go up in flames. Sergeant Hurd gave the order, reverse, and then stop, and then reverse, hoping to get into some cover. He said that a few times, and then suddenly, over the intercom, the driver said, the track's broken. So Hurd gave the order to the gunner to set the barrel straight, so it wouldn't block the driver's hatch, and they all barreled out. Around midday, Steel Brownlee's tank had run out of ammunition. So they found a tank that had been knocked out, that had brewed up, and they took all the ammunition they could from it and carried on. Then shortly afterwards, the two machine gun barrels they had had worn out. So they found another two barrels from another tank. After the fife, the Hussars were now emerging from the lanes through the mines. The guns that decimated C Squadron were now looking for new targets. Most of the tanks had skirted round the killing fields of Kanye, while A Squadron was screening Kanye, waiting for the guards to arrive. Now, Colonel von Luck was the commander of the 125th Panzer Grenadiers of the 21st Panzer Division. By a quirk of fate, he wasn't under the bombing. On the 14th of July, he'd been informed by Shep de Trich and Furstinger that he was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. So he'd been in Paris for that ceremony and a few days leave, and he was on his way back to Normandy on the morning of the 18th. Now his headquarters was at Fenneville, which is east of Cagny, over that way. And as he approached, he saw a haze in the air, but nothing to make him worried. When he got to Fenneville, Captain Schweisberg told him about the thousands of bombers that had gone over. He was appalled at the apathy of the officers in place. So he got a driver to take him in a command tank to Le Menil Fremantel, where we were before. And they couldn't even get past Cagney, he sort of was in ruins. And he saw dozens of British tanks crossing the road going southwards. So he's on his way back to Freneville and he saw some barrels sticking up in the air behind a wall. He went to see what was there and they were Luftwaffe anti-aircraft guns, 88 millimetres. He told the commander to use them on the tanks. The commander said, I'm under air command, those tanks aren't my problem. 
Now, Von Luck still had his dress uniform on, and he just had his small dress pistol that you wear in Paris. But he pulled it out, he went to see what was there, and they were Luftwaffe anti-aircraft guns, 88 millimeters. He told the commander to use them on the tanks. The commander said, I'm under air command. Those tanks aren't my problem. Now, Von Luck still had his dress uniform on, and he just had his small dress pistol that you wear in Paris. But he pulled it out, and he pointed it at the Luftwaffe man. He said, do you want to die now, or have a decoration later on? So the Luftwaffe officer was all for taking action straight away. Now, they didn't have to move far to get to a position, like we are here, where you can see Le Menil Fremendel and Le Priory. This is just as Squadron C of the Fives were coming into range. Back at his HQ, Von Luck had a message from Furstinger that no reinforcements could be sent. Of the 50 tanks in the bombing area, only six are action on the day. The Tiger Battalion at Emierville was out of action. The commanders had only saved themselves by hiding under a stairwell in the chateau. One Tiger had taken a direct hit from a bomb and there was nothing left to be seen of it. Another Tiger, the bomb nearly hit it, just landed next to it, and the 58-ton tank was flipped over on its top. Around 10 a.m., Lieutenant von Rosen led six Tigers from Manneville, which is the other side of La Priory over there, which is as northeast of here. He, he was going to bypass Cagny. Just after they started, two of them overheated and had to stop. Now, these four Tigers could have spelt disaster to the British tank effort. They were crossing the path of the 23rd Hussars. They now found that after the tanks being shaken up by the bombing, they needed three shots instead of one to hit a target. And then suddenly an armor-piercing shell went right through a Tiger. Now von Rosen was amazed that the British had anything like this. And he retreated to Manneville. It was later determined that the, the armor-piercing shell came from a Luftwaffe 88mm. Now the Germans are now starting to recover from the bombing. And even the Germans on the Bavent Wood, which is that hill over there, that's the northeast, they were attacking the British left flank. Bill Close and the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment were now fighting an isolated battle west of the railway line. Lieutenant Steilman was called by Colonel Silvertop to go and reconnoitre Hubert Folly. He said, you'll drive hell for leather, and if you come back, we'll know it's not occupied. That was very reassuring for Steilman. A short barrage would be fired on the town. The last shell would be a phosphorus shell, giving off white smoke. That would be the signal to go. So the raft tracks roared through the town and came back to report the town was empty. Of course, this wasn't actually the case. The Germans in the town had perhaps been intimidated by three carriers with guns blazing hurtling through the town, or just didn't want to give away their positions. The 3rd Royal Tank Regiment started advancing to Bra and Hubert Folly. As they came level with Bra, the anti-tank gunfire started Blazing men were rolling on the floor and put out the flames. Men clambered on reversing tanks to get out of the way. Bill Close's tank was hit. The men bailed out. Close sent them back to the railway embankment. He took over another tank to continue the battle. The tanks of B Squadron got up onto the ridge of Borgibu. No resistance, till suddenly several tanks were knocked out. Jim Caswell told the driver, Trooper Barnes, to reverse. Then they were hit by a shell which killed the gunner and wounded the radio operator. Jim Caswell hauled Stan Duckworth out of the turret and wondered why the tank was still reversing. The driver had invented a contraption to keep the tank reversing even if he was wounded or killed. 
Jim Caswell carried the operator for an hour to the A station. Colonel Silvertop ordered the retreat to the embankment. The 3rd Royal Tank Regiment passed the night in a quarry by the embankment. The fives and the Hussars became bogged down around four, which is just here. Two squadrons were enough to dislodge the Germans. Many of the tanks that did survive, survived because the Germans couldn't tell the difference between tanks that had been knocked out and tanks that were still active. The 23rd Hussars had arrived at 1400 hours, crossing the Caen to Paris railway line, which is just up there. Their orders were to go along the eastern side of the Steelworks Railway, which is over that way, and head towards Borgabou. They come up against a wreckage of many Fife tanks around four. Colonel Harding and many other tanks were put into reverse. Colonel Harding's tank was being followed by a Panther, and that Panther was being followed by another Sherman. And unfortunately, the Sherman got a shot right under the turret of the Panther, knocking it out. By 1500 hours, the tanks had reversed and to regroup near the railway line. This is when Steel Brownie met the Hussars. I mentioned him earlier on. Captain Peter Waters saw the Germans ready to mount a counterattack. He tried to contact the artillery by radio. All he could pick up was the BBC and they managed to relay the information to the artillery and very soon the artillery barrage fell on the Germans. A squadron attempted right hook around four. Jack Thorpe's tank was going up a rise and then suddenly they saw a panther coming straight at them. They fired at it when they bounced off and they were reversing. They managed to reverse out of the way back to shelter. The guards division followed the 11th armoured they found out two squadron to cover the left flank. Panthers had been seen in a wood near Emierville. Allied soldiers often took a German tank for a Tiger when they were normally Mark IVs, but this time it was a Tiger that was a mistake for a Panther. They were actually Tigers. One had fallen in the crater and the other was knocked out by the firefly of Lieutenant Locke. The Tigers retreated to lick their wounds. Lieutenant John Gorman got separated from his troop by getting stuck in a stream. Once they were towed out by another tank, they hurried on to catch up, and then they came up against the King Tiger. This is the first time they'd seen one of these. Now, fortunately for them, the commander of the Tiger was inexperienced, and they were lost. Now, the Tiger fired at them, but missed. And then the commander of the Tiger made the tank reverse into a hedge. The so Gorman's tank fired the Tiger, that just bounced off. Gorman said, fire again, and the, gunner said, the, the guns jammed. So Gorman said, well, ram it, and they just rammed into the Tiger. So the Tiger's out of action. Now they're both crews bailed out, and they were looking at each other trying to make the others understand that they were prisoners. But finally they just all gave up and went off to their own sides. So Gorman now took over the command of a firefly that had been immobilised. The commander had been, had been decapitated. So after getting the crew were a bit shocked, they cleaned up the sites and they set off. Their first mission was to go and find that tiger and they pumped a few armour-piercing shells into it to make sure it wouldn't move again. There's a memorial just here. By the end of the 18th of July, the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment were hanging on west of the Steelworks Railway Line. The Hussars had retreated to the Paris railway line. The guards had taken Cagny. So the Canadians had fought their way out of Caen and down the east bank of the canal and liberated Vaucelles. And the first British Corps were attacking through Bavon. 
on the night of the 18th, there was a rare incident. There was a Luftwaffe bombing raid against the bridges over the canals and the Orne. Now the bridges weren't hit, but with so many vehicles trying to get across, there were quite a few casualties. Some men in the armoured divisions didn't get the visit of their Q truck, which carried the rations. One commander of the Shropshire Light Infantry, he'd had the foresight to load up his jeep with a box of 100 bully beef tins. The 11th Armoured Division had lost half of its tanks on the 18th of July. Many of them were replaced by the next day. That was a luxury the Germans didn't have. German tanks knocked out were rarely replaced. Now the Battle of the 19th was going to be very different to the 18th. No massive bombing raid to precede the attack. On the 19th, the 11th was to assault Bra, which is now more or less joined to Khan. The North Fence Yeomanry, being the most intact regiment, would spearhead the attack, assisted by the 8th Rifle Brigade and an artillery bombardment. The Royal Tank Regiment were to assault Hubert Folly once Bra had fallen. The attack by the North Fence on Bra seemed to be faltering. It had no distinctive church, so the North Fence had gone too far west and came under anti-tank fire from If. So Lieutenant Colonel Silvertop sent the RTR to back them up. By 1800 hours, Bra was taken. Once the German defenders were forced to the edge of the village, they had no option but to flee across the open fields. After the success in Bra, the North Ants were initially repulsed from Hubert Folly. The Fives finished the job by 2000 hours, assisted by the King's Shropshire Light Infantry. The G Company commander, Noel Bell, called to cease firing, but a Sherman continued. It turned out to be a German in a Sherman knocked out the day before. The German was manning the machine gun. The Sherman was brewed up. For the King Shropshire Light Infantry, it had been a hard slog up an open slope with machine gun fire coming from the embankment. The 7th Armoured Division weren't across the River Rhône till 4.30 on the 19th. With Saulier and Four still in enemy hands, they were to move to Grunteville as a base to attack Borgabu. This would be concurrent with the 11th attack on Hubert Folly. But by nightfall, Borgabu still held out. The guards were still pressing against the Germans north of Cagny, but managed to liberate the town. They then supported the 7th attack on Four by entering Le Poirier Hamlet. After their success south of Caen on the 19th, the Canadians were to take over the area held by the sorely depleted 11th Armoured. Borgabu was finally taken on the 20th of July by the 5th Royal Tank Regiment of the 7th Division. They captured some abandoned Panthers. During Operation Atlantic, the Canadians built bridges across the Orne here, pontoon bridges. You can see the gap between the houses they used. The battle was deemed to be terminated on the 21st by General Dempsey. Goodwood had mobilised over a thousand tanks. Between 300 and 500 had been immobilised. The attack had cost over 4,000 casualties. The battle hadn't gained the advance hoped for by Dempsey, but it had struck a severe blow to the Germans. The way was now open for a breakout from Calm. The proud battle group of von Rosen's Tigers had failed to do any great damage to the Allied advance. The Germans' eyes were kept riveted in the east, easing the US breakout at San Lo, as Montgomery had always planned for. The 20th of July was the day of the bomb attempt on Hitler's life, which failed. Von Klug had a letter in his pocket with instructions of what to do in the event that the attempt succeeded. He was to organise the arrest of the 12th SS. That of course never happened, 